Good afternoon and welcome to the March 14th edition of Jazz 90's Crosstalk. And now here's your host, Kate Campbell. Yes, good afternoon. Welcome to another edition of uh, Ernest White's Crosstalk. This is Kate Campbell sitting in for Ernest. Thank you, Ernest. Uh, today we have in the studio members of the African American Writers Guild, and at this, and I'll have you, uh, I'll have them introduce themselves in one minute. But also in the second hour we have uh, former Police Chief Maurice T. Turner who will be with us. And rather than uh, talk dialogue with him myself, I'm going to open the phones immediately so you can ask him the kinds of questions you've been wanting to ask him. He's here for that. Um, also, before we talk with the members of the Writers Guild, I'd like to inform you that uh, the African American Legal Defense Pack is sponsoring an Afrocentric fashion show, and that's tomorrow, Thursday, at 7 p.m. at Howard University's Blackburn Center. And the uh, fashions are by Mishka, and if you have never seen her fashions, I, I, uh, you're really in for a treat. I saw her uh, show at the um, Ayo Handy's, um, what was that, the African... Uh, Holiday Expo. Holiday Expo. Thank you. Thank you. And it was wonderful. Lots of silk, beautiful wraps. So we'll be giving away a pair of tickets in the first hour and another pair in the second hour. So that'll be the third person who calls in. And now I'd like to uh, have members of the African American Writers Guild introduce themselves to you. Yes. My name is Ronald Steele. I'm the president of the African American Writers Guild. My name is Nikichi Taifa, and I am membership director at the Guild, and I'm also an author and a lawyer. My name is Diane Simpkins. I'm the My name is Diane Simpkins. I'm the coordinator of the Writers Workshop and also the coordinator of the uh, book discussion group. Uh, my name is Clyde McIlvain. I'm the past secretary and marketing director for the African American Writers Guild. My name is Jim Granger and I've worked on the African American Writers Guild's newsletter Word Up and I'm also an author. And welcome all of you to Crosstalk. Now, while you're here. <laughs> uh, let me let me let me uh, volunteer to tell you. Um, let me first try to put the African American Writers Guild in context with our history. Um, first of all, African Americans have, I mean, Africans have been on Earth, it's been documented for more than 2.5 million years. Out of nature, our ancestors invented civilization, all the arts and sciences, including archaeology, uh, the, numeric, the numbering system, math, higher forms of math, architecture. Uh, geology, geography, etc., yes. and so forth. Um, when we were, when our civilization was destroyed and we were brought to America, our knowledge of our greatness, our knowledge of ourselves, was effectively erased. Uh, our, our slave, I mean, our uh, enslavers um, made it illegal for us to practice our language. They made it illegal for us to practice our history, our religion. And they also made it illegal for us to read. So as a process of over so many generations, we forgot who we were. When it was legal again for us to read, um, they had designed by then, had taken from Africa all the knowledge from Africa and designed an educational system that was predicated not on meritocracy but on white supremacy. And it was that education that they gave Africans. Uh, and it effectively sealed our amnesia, our collective amnesia. So, and that education still thrives today. Oh, very, no question. Very yes. little of it has changed. Mm -hmm. So for the most part, most African Americans are so Europeanized that they think they're white. They identify with being white. And they hate being black. And they don't identify with being African. You know, it's interesting that you should mention that because uh, I'm going to be working with some of the teachers through the public uh, school system and uh, one of the things that I've been working on is this um, the Dewey system of European and American education and it was based it was consciously thought by the uh, well, let's see the Germans and the English to uh, bring a, a, a closed sort of a European style education into the American system now it's interesting also because the European the two European countries England and Germany are the same ones who spent most time were some of the earliest Egyptologists who understood clearly where a lot of the arts and sciences and mathematics were coming from. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let me finish telling you uh, how the African American Writers Guild fit into this equation. Mm -hmm. um, we are 181 writers of all genres who have come together dedicated to promote African American literature and literacy. It is the most effective way of regenerating our mass behavior. Um, the Guild through the Writers' Workshop, the Book Discussion Group, the Newsletter, the Meet the Author Series, and a number of other workshops. We hope we inspire, 
uh, provoke and encourage readers to read Afrocentric literature, um, writers to uh, write and be published. And again, this is a long-term plan, but this is a way we hope to address the issue of our miseducation, to correct our miseducation and to uh, inspire African Americans to bring out their best. And so you're also interested in getting new subscribers to the Guild? Absolutely. Yes. Uh, yes, I was talking earlier with um, your Diane. name? Diane. <laughs> yes, and we were talking a little bit about Toni Morrison. But I'd like to hear what you're doing in terms of your um, workshop at the uh, D.C. Public Library. Um, that's the uh, book discussion group, and um, once a month we gather at the library to discuss the book that we've read for that month. We meet the second Sunday at 2 p.m. at the Martin Luther King Library. Last month we discussed our founder's book, Long Distance Life. Marita Golden was, is the author. We really enjoyed that. We had a very nice uh, group of uh, members of the African American Writers Guild. We had uh, ages running from 22 to 57 years old, and we all related to the characters in one way or another. It was it was an exciting afternoon. And what was the age range again? You mentioned 22 to 57. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things I like about a book discussion group. When you read a book, you get a chance to um, talk about how you felt about the book with other people who may or may not feel the same way you felt. And it's interesting the kind of discussion that can come up, and it's interesting the things that we remember from our childhood and from, uh, you know, our growing up days and our, depending on what age you are, or your middle years or what have you, and the kinds of experiences that you can bring to, um, to um, a group like that. Are these ongoing discussion groups? That's right. So anyone month. could come in? Yes, you have mm -hmm. to be a member of the, um, of the uh, Writers Guild. Well, we may as well clear that up now. How do you become a member? Uh, we I'd like to yes. talk about that. Oh, please. Sure. <laughs> That's right. You're the member. As one of the, the <laughs> newly fine. appointed membership uh, director, uh, first of all, let's, I'd like to talk about just what is the Guild, uh, more concretely, other than the historical um, perspective that Ronald gave, but it's basically a nonprofit organization dedicated to promoting African American literature and um, literacy, and to also making the works of African um, uh, writers, African American writers, more accessible throughout the whole uh, community. And then we look at just who should join the Guild, or well, the various categories of people who we feel should join the Guild. First and foremost, published as well as unpublished writers, would-be writers, people who simply love to read, people who enjoy uh, attending literary events, writers who want to interact with other writers, people who just want to network, mm -hmm. you know, and the like. We, we, it's very inclusive. Um, the benefits of membership in the Guild are quite a few. Uh, first and foremost, uh, the, the person who joins the Guild has eligibility to attend the writers' workshops and the book study groups that Diane was speaking about. Uh, members get a 10% discount on all books um, uh, purchased at Pyramid Bookstore, and I think everyone knows now the Pyramid has three locations. Yeah. <laughs> so we're talking about 10% uh, discount at Pyramid Bookstores. And um, members also receive a 30% discount on tickets to um, uh, Guild-sponsored events and uh, activities. Uh, also, I think we're going to talk to the person who's heading up the newsletter, but there's an uh, 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 with your membership comes a uh, uh, free subscription to Word Up, which is the newsletter of the Guild. And also the uh, member receives updates on current events and changes in the publishing industry, information mm -hmm. about grants and tips on writings. Uh, uh, there, there, there are numerous seminars that focus on how to get published and no notices of job um, openings as well. So I'd like to get to just how much it costs which is uh, very, very nominal, and maybe very, very nominal um, <laughs> fee for all of these benefits. It's only a $15 membership um, fee for dues per year. And in keeping with our African tradition of honoring our elders and our, um, and our youth, the annual dues for seniors and for students is only $10. Oh, that's wonderful. You know, I was in one of uh, Marita Golden's uh, first workshops. I think that was in 1987. Mm -hmm at the Wartha Daniels Library, and I've let my membership fall, and I'm going to resubscribe. Oh, thank you. Yes. We'll give you an application today. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, let's hear a little bit about the uh, newsletter. Well, uh, the newsletter is the vehicle through which we uh, communicate the information that uh, 
was just identified. Uh, we have announcements in the uh, newsletter about the Guild's activities. We have tips, uh, what we call write tips, uh, publishing uh, houses and uh, publications looking for writers to fill specific needs. Uh, we have uh, news about the publishing industry in general, which is going uh, through a very traumatic time right now, a period of consolidation. And fortunately for us, we have an organization like the African American Writers Guild. Uh, my particular field is history. I I'm concerned with the history rather than the writing itself. I don't really consider myself a writer per se, and I'm not into uh, the literary aspect of it. Although he's guild. the author of two books. <laughs> right. Oh, yes? <laughs> <laughs> the Guild provides a vehicle for people like myself to network and exchange ideas with other people with similar interests in our history. And it also pre presents us with uh, uh, a mechanism to market books. Now, in the history of African American writers and, and African writers in general, uh, if we got through all of the obstacles that Ron identified that were put into our path and became literate and had the means and luck to uh, come across information to publish a book, uh, it was very painful to do so and several of our authors have paid the highest price. For example, George G.M. James who wrote Stolen Legacy just yeah. mysteriously died and Walter Rodney who wrote How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, they just mysteriously were murdered, you know, if you uh, want to cut it short. And the Guild pr provides a, a body in which uh, we can uh, exchange ideas with one another and uh, solve the, the, the hard part of getting ideas to the public. I mean, today with desktop publishing and uh, other technological advantages, the mechanics of putting the book together are not that hard and are becoming more inexpensive every day. The hard part is marketing a book. Yes. How do you get it into the distribution channel and specifically to uh, the African American community? Uh, we have a tough nut here in the United States. This society is not a literate society. One out of two people in the general population do not read books. One out of eight can't read books. When you break that down to the African American community, the statistics are even worse. Nevertheless, we have a mechanism in the African American Guild whereby we can contact the some 200 retail outlets uh, in the United States for African American books or Afrocentric books. Meeting people in the Guild like Clyde McElveney has been helpful to me. He helped me get my books into Seattle, Washington, Chicago, to name a few places. And I've had any number of responses from people around the country on the substance of what I write. I mean, I don't really care about the style. It's just not my interest. Uh, there are a lot of people who do care about such things, but uh, the interest in the substance has been very rewarding to me, and, and my first book, uh, Adam the Altaic Ring and the Children of the Sun, has been through five printings. The second book is sold out going into its second printing. I'm going to be at Pyramid Bookstore tonight from 5.30 to 7, the George Avenue location, talking to people, signing books. These things wouldn't be possible without an organization yes. like the African American Writers Guild. And I think in a time when our community is under such stress that this is a very, very positive development. You know, in keeping with what you just said, um, I was over at Howard the other day and I ran into one of my students, former students, mm -hmm. who's in the Upward Bound program there. Right. And I noticed he had a few textbooks and I looked at them and one was J.D. Salinger's Catcher in the Rye. Right. And I remember reading that when I was about his age. And although I, I take nothing away from J.D. Salinger, mm -hmm. I wonder about our African American teachers who continue to uh, ignore African American writers and uh, how, how do we reach them? Because I think if we could reach many of the teachers, then they obviously would have access to the students. What do we do? Well, uh, it's a tough nut to crack. Now, you'll get various opinions on how we do that. My favorite method, my preferred method for reaching those who are receptive in the community is to do it outside of the schools, where we have complete control and it's supplemented. And, uh, you know, that's the what I would call the defensive aspect of our strategy. The offensive aspect is to challenge these teachers in the school. And, and we have to provide the community with the knowledge that when a teacher tells our children, for example, that Columbus discovered America, that's wrong. Here's the evidence. Columbus's own journal says there were African people here when he got here. Uh, 
Yeah, but how do we go about doing that? Who is going to... Well, there's to... a movement going mm -hmm. on in the community demanding an Afrocentric curriculum mm -hmm. uh, in the school system. Um, also, the Guild is about the business of reestablishing a schools committee, which would be dedicated also to bringing African-American literature to the school. But as James said earlier, it is a tough nut to crack yes. because most of these teachers and administrators have also been brainwashed. Exactly. And they've been Europeanized. Yes, they and, have vested and, interests. And they, yes. they, they don't identify with the uh, Af Africans or the African di diaspora or African-Americans to that extent, no more than most brainwashed Negroes. Uh, those... Nikichi Taifi is a former teacher in the D.C. Uh, school system, black independent school system. Mm -hmm. I'm sure she can elaborate on yes. this. Yeah, that's true. And uh, it's interesting, those same teachers that were um, promoting Salinger's Catcher in the Rye could have quite effectively gotten the same things across with Claude Brown's Man, Child, and the Promised no Land. Question. Exactly. And at that yes. age, um, I was reading Catcher in the Rye, but I was also reading Man, Child, and the Promised Land, not through the public through school system, but through my own um, growing awareness of our uh, history and our culture. And shortly after that, I was reading the autobiography of uh, Malcolm X. And it was books such as those which served to uh, con concretize within me the necessity um, uh, of when I got older to make sure that our youth would have those necessary tools possible to ensure that they would build their nation. And that's one of the reasons why I sought to write Shining Legacy, which is um, a book about um, famous black heroes and heroines of our past. When we get into the, um, um, uh, the whole situation with the public school system, it is crucial Yes. that our youth have this information. And one of the things that the Guild um, seeks to promote and put forward is to ensure that this information gets to all of our people. Uh, yes. I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, in, in reference to that, Carter G. Whitson said something that we should remember. He said that the best educated of us, he said Negroes during that, during that period, but of us Africans, are the least capable of educating our people in the manner in which we should be educated. So. Uh, when you look at the, my interest is business, and when you look at the business end of publishing, you're talking about $14 billion a year industry in 1988, 89, I think it, that was a figure that was that had been tossed around. And the people who control this industry, of course, are Europeans, and they have much to lose if and when the school system changes its books. Hmm. Yes. So you have to look at yeah, it. Exactly. So you have to look at the financial aspect of it. Supremacy. And my contribution to the Guild has been and still is to uh, make certain that writers don't get so caught up in the writing. Because I'm not a writer. I'm a bibliophile. I collect books by and about African people. I'm working on a book, however, on uh, blacks in the business of publishing because there is a business here that we need to take a look at. And as uh, Mr. Granger said, one of the most difficult aspects of this whole uh, process is getting your your merchandise and is what it is merchandise marketed. it's getting it marketed getting it distributed and i found out working with about five or six local writers that one of the best ways to get your work distributed or marketed is to go before the com be, be, go before the person who's going to read it and explain to him or her what's in the book because we don't as a, a whole get exposure through the press we our books don't get reviewed most of the books are self-published. In many instances, they, don't, they never make the library systems. So we have some work to do, and I do my best to encourage and support uh, writers and aspiring writers to make certain that they cover the business aspect of publishing. You know, I was just going to say, uh, what's wrong with going to the schoolhouse door and taking it, as you said, right to the teacher firsthand? Well, the, her the problem with it is, again, that person has been trained in the Eurocentric uh, educational system. See, when you hear people talking about infusion of African, uh, African-centered education, and that's not the issue here. The issue here, and I'll say this quietly so nobody will hear me, is to sh change the entire system. Change the entire, entire system. The question yes. is, are we going to leave Eurocentric, what are we going to leave of Eurocentric information into the African-centered uh, system? We designed the education system. If it wasn't for Africans, the, the, the public the school system public in America right. wouldn't exist. Yes. So we American invented it, and we have, a, we have a system that works. I want to challenge a parent to not look at children's report cards. To you, Your child should be evaluated on how well it performs, not how well some teacher decides what, kind, what grade to give it, it the, the, or Clyde, what test to give it. Clyde is exactly right. There's more at stake here than 
you know, a fairly academic issue of who was the first to voyage across the Atlantic. Really what's at stake is the whole system. When you break down the whole concept that Europeans invented everything and did everything, then the the philosophical underpinning for, for example, the flights in Angola today that are being sent there to flat out murder black people is destroyed. The whole economic system, the whole social structure of um, this crumbling Western world is accelerated in its destruction. Uh, I don't think personally that we need to be all that concerned with convincing people who don't want to be convinced. I think mm -hmm. that in, in terms of the time element, which is very short, I mean, we're under stress as a culture, that we need to focus on dealing with those who are ready to progress. And uh, for that reason, I favor dealing outside of the school for the education of our community for those who are ready and challenging the people in the school uh, when they're misinformation is, is gross and apparent. Uh, we have to understand, like Clyde said about the grades, if you don't say in a history course in most schools, inc including most traditionally black universities or so-called black universities, that the Greeks invented civilization, you fail. Yes, you know, true. You fail. Yes. So, uh, you know, I, to turn that around is really, to me, um, in view of our limited resources, a, a waste of energy, except as uh, uh, to challenge and to secure more people for things that we put on outside of the schools. I'm not really concerned with saving uh, the school system as it exists today. I'm concerned with uh, trying to build a new school system that's focused on what is true rather than what's politically expedient. Yes, as a former teacher in the D.C. public schools myself, I certainly agree with what you've said. Let's uh, go to our, well, we have one other Thank comment, you. then we'll go to I our I just want to make one yes. brief comment mm -hmm. regarding why we don't go up to the school system mm -hmm. and knock on its doors. For the same reason why you don't go to that brother on the corner and tell him to stop dealing drugs and start supporting black businesses because you know you would be spinning wheels and getting nowhere. You would have to take a therapist with you. You would probably have to take an executioner with you to buy a little chorus to get them to come around. So what we do as the African American Writers Guild is make the literature available. We promote writers, aspiring writers to write and we promote uh, writers to get published. And as he mentioned about self-publishing, you will find that most African-American writers who are writing substantive literature have to publish it Them themselves so. because yes. the white institutions, mm -hmm. white publishing houses won't go near it. Well, what that they makes will, sense, doesn't it? Sure. <laughs> yeah. What they will publish is books about blacks doing each other in, mm -hmm. you know, women versus men, men versus women, etc. and so forth. So most of the members of the guild who are published are self-published. Nikichi Taifi, who wrote this beautiful book, Shining Legacy, which has reframed our history into poems, po poetic stories. I mean, any rap group can take these stories and turn them into a song. And that's a pyramid, right? That yes. Pyramid. Okay. She had to publish that book herself. She had to create her own distribution system, and we should not be discouraged by that. That is our destiny. And it's going into its seventh printing right Wonderful. now. I'm going to get a copy. <laughs> uh, all of our lines are lit up. Um, before we go to the telephone lines, I'd just like to say that Brian Coleman of Washington, D.C. is the winner of the pair of tickets for the uh, Afrocentric Fashion Show. Congratulations, Brian. And we'll take our first call now. Put on your earphones. Hello. Yes, hello. Yes, um, we are new uh, members of the African American Writers Guild. like to say to the panel, um, you guys are doing a fantastic job. Uh, we, as the Universal Messengers of Music, fully support you. We've uh, just recently, as of yesterday, spoken to Willie Wilson, who's willing to give us three dates to come out um, at his place and, and use uh, our music as a means of drawing some of the community members uh, to focus in on your books. Uh, I'm, ha I'm giving an open invitation right now for you guys at the, at the AAWG to get some of your authors who are willing to come into the Southeast area and to help us to promote uh, literacy and African-American literature. Uh, these are going to be summer programs between the months of July and August, but this is something that, that I'm very excited about, being a member of uh, the Universal Messengers of Music. And I'd like to say to the people in the audience, uh, listening audience, uh, that this organization is, is absolutely necessary. I, 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 uh, have been extremely inspired um, by their work and 
looking at uh, the results of their, their, their labor. Um, I know doggone well that when I was in the New York City school system, um, I needed someone to, 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 to sponsor and support me. And I know in the Washington, D.C. area, there's probably a million people like myself who can use the African-American writing skill as a means of, I don't know, uh, developing a better outlook on oneself as well as defining and developing skills in the writing and literature area. I just want to take my hat off to you guys. Um, I guess I do have a question, uh, and that would be, um, Thank you. do you have any sort of um, uh, events that will be coming up in the near future that you might be able to um, tell the listening audience to come to that might be able to be supported uh, by us people who, who like what you're doing? Thank, Thank you for your call. Right. Thank you very much for your call and your question and your comment. Um, speaking of upcoming events, on March the 22nd, the African American Writers Guild will present its 10th in a series of Meet the Author Lectures. This will be a, tri a trilogy, trilogy uh, which, will, which will feature James Granger, who is with us now. He is the author of uh, Adam, the Altaic Ring, and Children of the Sun, and also the book entitled Mo. Both are mega histories on the evolution and the immigration of the human race. Um, the uh, tr uh, trilogy would also include Deborah Williams Garner, who is a performing poet and author of Pipe Dreams, and it will also include Brian Gilmore, who is a performing poet and author of soon to be published, Elvis Presley is a Alive and Well and Living in Harlem. <laughs> um, <laughs> he's an excellent poet, and you, you got to come out to hear. Why don't you uh, give the address? I will. Yeah. You got to come out and hear him. That is again. That's on March the twenty-second at six thirty p.m. It will be at UDC's Carnegie Library Community Room, which is located at eight hundred Mount Vernon Place Northwest, near the Gallery Place Metro Stop. And while we're talking about the location, let me please say on behalf of the Gill, thank you to the University of District of Columbia for accommodating us with this space. Uh, oh. I, I just so happen to be a graduate of UDC, and I'm especially proud. Oh, that's the function of the uh, WDCU radio. Yes, right. it's for the community. Thank you. Um, also, why don't you give the uh, telephone number and P.O. box for the African American Writers Guild? Okay, the telephone number for the Guild is 722-2760. I'm going to repeat that, 722-2760. And the address is P.O. Box 43874, Columbia Heights Station, Washington, D.C., 20010. And it's only a $15 uh, annual fee exactly. with all the goodies uh, all throughout the, the year. You can't beat that. <laughs> right. <laughs> Wonderful. There, there is a small admission fee for this Meet the Author event. Okay, fine. But if you're a member of the Guild, you get a 30% discount. Thank you. <laughs> okay, let's go back to our phone lines. Hello, you're on the air. Good afternoon, Kay. Good afternoon. Um, it's a very interesting discussion. I have a question which will arouse my curiosity. The young man, what's his name? Uh, the gentleman's name there? Uh, there's several. Uh, the uh, you one, mean the, the first one who was doing it? Uh, who was just talking? No, the one who was first introduced on the program. Ronald Steele. Steele? Yes, Steele. Steel. Steel. S T E E L E. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, you said most Afro Americans identify as white and think they are white, and uh, I would like to know. I like to learn something new every day, and I am really curious about that. Over 35 million blacks or Afro Americans in the United States. Where do you get your authoritative reference that most of them identify as white? Thank you for asking that question. I think that's an excellent question. If you look around you, number one, um, there's more than $250 billion that goes through our hands every year. If we were a nation of people, we would be, I think, the sixth, if not the ninth, uh, wealthiest nation on earth. As soon as we get that money, what do we do with it? Do we, do we seek out African Americans to spend that money with? No, we seek out white folks to spend that money with. Um, when, we just, when we groom our children for higher education, what do we think? Do we think that it was, it's more effective and, better and, 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 and it better serves our interests to send our students to African-centric schools or predominantly African-American schools? No, generally we, we, we conclude that um, 
our children will be better educated if they go to a white school. That is identifying with white folks and not identifying or working in your own best interest. In addition to that, you have a lot of African Americans who are wearing different colored contact lenses. They're trying to get blue eyes. They got brown, the greatest colored eyes in the world because it's filled with melanin and it does so many wondrous things for us. Um, but uh, uh, there are countless examples in which I can give you that clearly show that African Americans identify with white people, not, I mean, rather than their own. Another brief example is our dress. Very few African Americans wear African clothes. When you go into their homes, it's not decorated with African artifacts. It's decorated with uh, George Washington or Abraham Lincoln or, or John F. Kennedy or Robert Kennedy. So there are the examples of African Americans identifying with white people rather than identifying with their own. Well, I won't uh, dispute any of that. That is true. But uh, when you say most, that means more than half. And that means uh, at least 15 or 20 million are doing that. And, uh, That's correct, sir. Unless uh, you can really pinpoint that, you cannot say that. You have to pinpoint these things. What you're speaking is in generalities. Uh, we have another. An yeah, let there's one other comment, sir. I, I just would like to say that um, Ronald Steele is the author of an article that recently came out called African American Know, know Thyself, yeah. in which a lot of these concepts that he's been speaking of is within. He's also the author of an article called Afrocentricity, right. which was recently published, I think, in, the, uh, in, in Players Magazine. And he has an article coming out tomorrow in the Washington Informer um, dealing with another important issue. One of the things I think that's good about the Guild is that writers get a chance to express themselves in terms of their views and, um, um, you know, and the like. And it inspires us to put our words and put our thoughts and feelings on, um, on paper. Um, well, I that's think it's excellent. Well, I can we understand that. Now, we had a gentleman there uh, on Monday who did some research on, on the Penal Institution. So, see, his was documented with numbers, facts, and everything. But just to make a general, he could say Right, that was okay. documented. Um, One in four yeah, black males are under some type most. of court supervision. More. Um, black males under court supervision than um, currently in the colleges. Again, one of the reasons and purposes of the Guild is to try to, to dissipate those statistics, to make it so that we are a literate community and a literate um, uh, nation of African people here on, on this shore well, as I opposed to being subjected to I the criminal justice system. I appreciate your organization thoroughly and everything that you're saying with that one exception. You just cannot indict a whole race of people who are saying most just on the general principle of going into people's houses or seeing somewhere and uh, different types of clothes. Uh, sir, your, your point is well taken, but we're going to move on. Thank you. Thank you. I don't like it, but thank you. No, we, thank you for it, calling. No, it's not a matter of not liking it or not. Uh, we're willing to listen to all points of view, and it is well taken. Thank you for calling. Next call, please. Oh, hi. Yes, everybody. hello. Listen, uh, what I'm trying to get at is, okay, now, okay, at this age, 40, I'm suddenly inspired to, to write and I'm, I am African-American. I would rather deal with African-American as far as publishing and, and so forth. Would there, could there be, even at that age, someone to help that person if he or she is uh, inspired to write? Such as the, I mean, could the African-American guild? What kind of help are you talking about? Okay, for instance, I, I'm, I'm, I'm in the process of writing. Mm -hmm. And, and I've gotten a lot of materialists and so forth. Right. And I would, uh, at one time or the other, somewhere along the line, I'll be about ready to at least get with someone like a publisher, publisher or someone who is uh, who, who who will look at the material and, and so forth. Right. I don't want to go to to a, you know Europeans or anything like that because they would not. Uh, as you know yourself, they don't recognize us in a way when right. we were writing. Well, there, there are a lot of different ways the Guild could help you in that respect. First off, there are workshops where um, you can bounce your work off of other people, see how it's received, uh, see uh, what their critique of your work is, both substantively and, and in terms of the expression. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the mechanics of publishing, we have people within the Guild. I mentioned Clyde McElveney recently, who's in the business of uh, bringing people to publication. Mm -hmm. And how does one get in touch with Clyde uh, well, uh, or, or, or should I, 
or should I keep in touch with the uh, African American Guild? Right. I, I guild? think the first thing to do is to join the guild. Join the guild, which right. is the fifteen dollar right. annual fee. Right. Okay, and that sounds pretty good. Right. And, now, you, and, and you will get also uh, as part of that the newsletter, which will point you to writing uh, opportunities and to all of these programs that I'm telling you about. Because I, you know, well, uh, oh, sir. Um, I'd like to tell you that we also have a writer's workshop that okay. comes along with that $15 membership fee. Okay. The writer's workshop meets every other Wednesday at 7.30. Uh -huh. And um, what we do is we read each other's work and we critique it okay. in a professional manner. Okay. We have people in our workshop that are published. We have people that are unpublished. Uh -huh. As a matter of fact, we even have a 13-year-old person and we have a... 77-year-old person, uh, which I think is a uh, very interesting it for is. a workshop. <laughs> yeah, I was sort of and, interested on that. <laughs> yeah, and uh, currently we are, there is a, a man who has spent, uh, he's retired from the military, and he's written a book of his experiences in Vietnam. See, I've, and, I've, I'm, writing, so I'm writing experiences of my growing up in D.C. Well, that's that's wonderful. <laughs> it certainly is. It certainly is. And I believe, I, I think I think you ought to become a member of the Guild and okay. then come on in and join and us in our workshop. Actually, I uh, just, um, Diane, I just reviewed the bylaws just before coming here. And actually, you said the Writers' Workshop meets every other Wednesday. He can come to the next workshop, the Writers' Workshop, even before joining the Guild, because he gets to come, I think, two or three times prior to actually sending in that $15. That's so right. you don't even have to wait to send in the money. Go to the workshop. She can tell you the the date of the, or perhaps call the station afterwards, the date okay. and location of the next. He can, um, call, he can call me at 726 1224. 1224. And I'd, I'd be more than happy to talk with you and tell you exactly what it is that we do. And we have been very successful. Okay, what's your name? Your name. Your name. The one oh, my name is Diane Simpkins. So okay, just Diane. ask for Diane and okay. call that number. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your call. Mm, sure. Yes, you're on the air, sir. Hello there. I think you're doing a fantastic job with your organization. At the same time, I must agree with the caller who called, uh, maybe two calls before, about the generalizations that were made. Uh, I have one question for Mr. Steele. Um, are you wearing African clothing today? That's a, that's a good question, sir. I wear a kufi every day. I wear a ring that denotes my identity. And I also uh, have a closet full of African clothes. Beautiful. And uh, I have one point also. I work in an organization that... Uh, has many African members, and uh, although I consider myself an African American, I know several Africans who don't wear African clothing, and I don't think that we should stop at the clothing. It's the substance of a person, not the outward appearance. Thank you very much. Thank you for your call, sir. Yes, you're on the air. Hello? Yes. Uh, yes, I'd like to know, where might one pick up an application to join your organization? Just call 722-2760. Go or go by Pyramid Bookstore on Georgia Avenue or any one of its three locations and okay, you can I didn't get the phone number. 722 2760. 27 what? 60. 60. Okay, and who do I ask for at that number? Um, just state your uh, interest and okay. someone will get back in touch with you okay. or send you the information you request. Right, I appreciate that. Yes, sir. Thank, Thank you for your call. Um, I understand at some point there was to be or there were uh, children's workshops and poetry and fiction. Has that come yes, up? Yes, as a matter of fact, uh, about two years ago. About two years ago, we did something that I always thought was one of the most exciting things that the Guild ever did. And what we did was we had a poet on every corner. And we did it around the Reeves Center. On uh, every corner, there was a crowd gathered to hear a poet recite his or her poetry and then we went inside of the Reeves Center and spent the entire evening reading and celebrating the poetry of our brothers and sisters. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> wonderful. And also so there are ongoing programs um, for children um, within we don't the have at this point we do not have uh, anything special for children although at one point we did have a special program for children and they published several newsletters. We're a strictly volunteer organization and I really want everyone to understand that that none of us here are paid one red cent for the work that we do but we really believe and that's why we do what we do. We spend a lot of time every week preparing for our programs and, and answering the calls for service in the community. And there is a need in the Guild for someone who's interested in taking on a schools committee. 
um, and working with children. So if you're out there, give us a call. Uh, I want to address this situation that Ron spoke about in terms of us not identifying, but we are trained to imitate uh, Europeans. And if the caller, two or three calls back, has a problem and he needs some uh, documentation, he should read The Miseducation of the Negro by Carter G. Woodson, who uh, clearly uh, delineates how we have been trained and educated to imitate the European. We had no other models in this country. Our language was taken from us. Our uh, philosophy, philosophy history. our history, our religion. So it, it is not a put down of an individual, but you, you must first understand what the problem is before you can solve it. And the problem with most of us, 99.9% .9 of us, is that we are forced to imitate the oppressor. You know, I wasn't uh, clear about that until I left the United States, and not only in Africa, but other parts of the world, people would ask me um, what my language was, uh, and about, my, about my people and so forth, and I'd say, well, I speak English, but yes, you speak English, but what is your language? And I began to look at myself and realize, yes, I did not have my language, right. and they expected me to give them the language of my my what grand my my ancestors, my ancestors and right. I was giving a language from England so I mean when we begin to look thoroughly at the uh, at us throughout the diaspora it's yes, not just in America no question I've been to Brazil I've been to Africa there are Africans who are less conscious mm -hmm. on the continent than they are here Americans, yeah. those of us who are conscious for the most part don't have too much money and those of us who have money aren't too conscious mm -hmm. no matter where we are so it is not the, the, the caller shouldn't take it as a, a personal indictment but it's an observation, and you need to look around. I'm amazed in this city. I walk through this city, and I see us dressed in our three-piece suits, and we, we literally uh, manage the nation's capital. Ninety percent of us haven't uh, realized it yet. We are in charge of the nation's capital. May I also comment that um, Did not get themselves, um, we wouldn't have nearly the amount of problems that we have, because once we are unified, um, there is no force on earth that will be able to impact on us the way white supremacy impacts on us now. The reason why it is so effective is because of our miseducation. And with that, let's try to clear up our last two callers here. Hello, sir, you're on the air, or oh, ma'am. Hello? <laughs> yes, hello. Yeah, uh, first of all, I think um, the point have, the po all the points have been well made in terms of uh, how things have gotten to uh, uh, degenerate to, to the level that they are in terms of us recognizing uh, why and the where. Uh, of course, you know, again, uh, 400 years of being displaced indeed has caused us to, or many of us, to forget uh, what it, where we come from and, and what, we, what made us where we are today. Certainly the people who are in control of uh, those things in terms of, uh, let's say, political people or your business people who are, are in a position where they can lead those things aren't doing that uh, because, again, uh, the way that we live, and this country dictates that we live basically a European style. Now, now I'm not agreeing that that's the only way. I'm simply saying that that's what's happened. And, and, and to a degree it's said, you can go into a Hispanic uh, person's house. My wife is Hispanic, and she has Hispanic artifacts around the home. And uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, the same pride hasn't been addressed in my, in my life by my family because uh, my parents Although my mother went to Howard University and graduated, uh, she uh, uh, apparently went the other way. And so uh, I find myself more today relating to the ethnic side of my, myself, the, uh, the African side uh, and, and the Hispanic side because I have children now and, uh, and uh, enjoying both ends of it and, and realizing that uh, we do need to address uh, our concerns to our forefathers. You know, that's an excellent example, sir, because uh, I found that, too, in many African-American homes. It's very rare that I will go into an African-American home and will find African or African-American artifacts or pictures on the wall. So that is something that uh, clearly states the problem for us. Are there other comments? I went to Howard University also, and uh, I found at Howard, you know, I was confronted with a choice. You either uh, tell the teacher what they want to hear, or you don't graduate. Uh, can uh, I let, make one last comment? Sure. Uh, you see, and, and, and Howard, and, and as well as all the other black colleges, and let me tell you, 
and, and I have to apologize again for being ignorant. I did not know there were as many black colleges as they are in this country. I was so proud to know it. I mean, we need more. And my mother told me about that. I mean, she took the time to tell me. And, and this is later as I was an adult, not as a child, because then I really understood the significance of why she went to Howard and uh, what it is that I have to do in order to show that uh, the brothers and sisters that we're responsible for, that we uh, have an obligation to, to let them know the whole truth, the whole history, and the whole culture. That's this is no question. And, 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 but one of the things that we're confronted with now is the disappearance of the so-called black institutions. That's right. That's uh, I can name you three or four right now, West Virginia State, Tennessee mm -hmm. State, uh, several others are now becoming majority white institutions. Yeah, that's and uh, that's just talking about biological race. Forget about what's being taught there. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that uh, for that reason, I think that, that yeah. I have to agree with the comment that Carter G. Woodson said. That, uh, Excellent panel uh, on the day as usual. And, uh, and, and, you know, when you call into a show like that and you hear, hear it coming from the heart, because that's where it's coming from, uh, you, you have to understand what it what, what has to be said must be said and may hurt some individuals but if it hurts you to the point that makes you take another look at yourself then it was effective thank you for your call sir and we have one last call hello you're on the air yes uh hello i have a question and comment first of all my comment is we have to raise the consciousness of african americans we have to raise their consciousness before there's any unity there has to be a level of consciousness raised about ourselves about our history and about our culture, you know, be it spiritual, mental, physical, emotional, our conscious level has to be raised and before there is any unity, you know, the conscious has to be raised. Oh, I think we all agree in your question. My question is uh, about the Writers Guild. What is the phone number and address? The okay. Writers Guild. The phone number is 722-2760. 722-2760, and the address is P.O. Box 43874, Columbia Heights Station, Washington, D.C., 20010. That's P.O. Box 43874, Columbia Heights Station, Washington, D.C., 20010. I have another question. Quickly, sir. Okay. How, how would you, as an African, African American man, how would we as African American Tease them to read, expose them to all the literature, all the history, and all of the information that you can put in their hands. Marcus Garvey said, don't go to bed without reading something. And in keeping with that, uh, the President Ronald Steele wanted to discuss with our audience the principles of the African American writing skill. Okay. Yeah, um, before I read them, I would just like to simply say that the reason why there is such a high rate of socially degenerate behavior in our community is because we are miseducated. When we are educated properly, we will do the right thing, and you'll see those social uh, uh, negatives disappear, or at least be uh, tremendously ameliorated. The principles of the African American Writers Guild are as follows. We are descendants of the earliest literate culture, committing ourselves to advance the practice of reading and writing among our people. We will, we will pursue this commitment within the context of the following principles. Historical awareness, record our enterprise for future generations, faith, develop the spiritual aspects of our community, collective responsibility to co contribute individual talents to attaining group goals, self-determination, encourage and foster the dreams, goals, and ideals of the members, empowerment, and trust ourselves with defining and achieving our own goals, creativity, utilize resources imaginatively as our ancestors did to survive, and self-knowledge, support each member in his or her understanding of his or her inner spirit. Thank you for this opportunity, Kate. Fine, thank you. And we have one last call, and then I want to uh, talk with uh, two of the writers here representing the Guild about their individual undertakings. Uh, hello, you're on the air. Uh, yes, uh, my, uh, first of all, I'd like to encourage the Guild to, to keep on doing what they're doing. And uh, uh, secondly, my question evolves around um, literacy. When you find most groups that are engaged in liberation, one of the first things they do, as was done in Cuba, is to try to, to uh, have a literate population. I was wondering what the Guild was doing around promoting literacy uh, within the school system, within the black community. Thank you. 
Yes, thank you for your call. Yes. Well, basically, our function, our role in literacy is is to make literature available, which is uh, an alternative to the Dick and Jane type literature and the Columbus Discovered America histories. Uh, we're involved with telling our story, and hopefully that will uh, engender people to read more because they'll have something that makes sense to them, something that they can relate to. We don't have specific reading teachers in the guild. Uh, we, we are primarily focused on providing materials that are sensible, accurate, and uh, engender positive things in, in our community. So that's the way we're helping to promote literacy. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit before we leave with uh, two of the writers here, James Granger. You know, I've been hearing quite a bit, bit about your book, Adam and the Altaic Ring. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about those and Children of the Sun. Okay, Adam, the Altaic Ring and the Children of the Sun was my first book, and it was published early in 1988 and it deals with what I call mega history. And mega history is the history of the origin and migrations of the races of humanity. Uh, how the races evolved, where they evolved, how they developed their respective cultures. Uh, this book was out, went through several printings and uh, in talking to audiences around the country, uh, many issues were raised and uh, I responded to those issues in the second book which is titled Mo. Um, I'm going to respond to those issues again tonight, again at Pyramid Bookstore, George and Harvard Streets, Northwest. It's an ongoing enterprise, an ongoing evolution in the development of a thesis about how the races came to be and uh, how they developed their respective cultures. I build on the works of many black historians like Chancellor Williams, like George G.M. James, like uh, Ivan Van Sertima, like uh, Sheikh Anta Diop. And uh, unfortunately, um, many, many people in this community uh, here in Washington and around the country have never heard of these people. They don't know that Chancellor Williams was a historian who spent 16 years of his life uh, going through Africa and Europe uncovering our past. They don't know that Sheikh Anta Diop was a man who uh, developed a radiocarbon laboratory in West Africa and documented that the uh, pharaohs of ancient Egypt were black people, contrary to the recent Washington Post and Washington Times article. So uh, there's an education necessary to get to the level to deal with how the races came to be, but fortunately there's a core group who are ready to move, and that's the group that, that I'm focusing on. That's the people that, that I have uh, very rewarding discussions for me, and I hope for them, uh, about uh, my work. I have a third book in progress now, which should be out in the next 60 days, called A Black Man's Bible, that deals with uh, the philosophy of uh, the ancient world, uh, ancient black world, which was a very, very scientific philosophy and uh, dealt with the reality of, of nature. Uh, and uh, I'm going to see uh, what the response is to that. Uh, I've openly challenged the some of the clergy in the uh, community to respond to some of my <laughs> assertions in my work. And so far the score is one to nothing in my favor because <laughs> nobody's responded. Uh, I'm going to challenge him again with a black man's Bible and see what happens. Uh, those in the listening audience who are interested in hearing more about these three books, uh, please come out tomorrow for the Meet the Author Lecture Series number 10 sponsored by the African American. It's not tomorrow? Oh, pardon me, wrong date. <laughs> Thursday, March 22nd, next week, okay, in the African American Writers Guild Meet the Author Lecture Series number 10. And this will be at the uh, Pyramid Bookshop on Georgia Avenue. Also appearing, oh, I'm getting it all wrong, yeah. pardon me. James Granger will be at Pyramid this evening. Oh, is that what it yeah. is? Okay. The Meet the Author the Series author. will be at the UDC Carnegie Library Community Room on okay. March 22nd. Okay, so let's go over that again. James Granger, the author you've just been listening to, will be... At Pyramid Bookstore. At Book Pyramid School. tonight. At Georgia tonight. And Harvard. At Georgia okay. and Harvard tonight. And uh, Deborah William Garnett and Brian Gilmore will be at the UDC Carnegie Library next Thursday, March 22nd. But before we close, I'd like to also talk a little bit with Nkechi Taifa, who has also written her book entitled Shining, Shining Legacy. Legacy. Yes. yes to, Kate, uh, to me, Shining Legacy is a golden treasury of story poems and tales designed to balance the image that traditionally in this country books for children have served to solidify the history, the culture, and the heroes of the white population in, this, uh, in the U.S. 
And this unbalanced trend is concretized in many schools. It's given sustenance through the uh, television and also through the books and other um, medium. But through information and stimulation, Shining Legacy is designed to reverse that, that trend to instill in our youth and black youth a sense of pride and identity in their culture, their heritage, and, and, and their history. And the book seeks to structure the learning experience in a, a motivating way so that retaining historical data such as just who Malcolm X is and Marcus Garvey. And when he was born. To the, yes. When he was born mm -hmm. and what he did. Mm -hmm. um, Rosa Parks, Denmark Vesey, Joseph St. Q, Toussaint Louverture, all of these heroes and heroines, um, Fannie Lou Hamer, mm -hmm. within Shining Legacy, so that retaining that information is not a brainwashing drudgery, yes. but an inspiring joy. And that's what Shining Legacy is all about. I'm looking forward to reading it myself. I understand we have one caller who's been holding on for almost 10 minutes. Let's take him before we leave the air. Hello, you're on the air. Thank you for taking me. I'd like to make a comment. <clears throat> the, uh, it sounds like the AAWG is an organization number one for you um, listening. It's an organization that has um, volunteers that run the organization. seems like they're doing a great deal um, to make our community whole. Uh, they have a big task ahead of them, so apparently when uh, we listen and we criticize, we should really be thinking about how we listeners can get involved with these folks who have dedicated their time and effort to help out our problem because it's a community problem, it's a na national problem, and it's a problem that has been with us ever since we were drug over here from the mother country, mother continent. Uh, bottom line, and I guess you know, time is of the essence, but bottom line is that I think we need to, as listeners, as a listening audience, support this organization, the African American Writers Thank Guild. Thank you so much. Um, I think that we should begin to think not so much of how we can criticize what one or two people may say or, or how they phrased it or concepts that we don't like, but get involved with what is necessary. We know certainly literacy is necessary, getting the, 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 the African American um, uh, literature into the schools is necessary. Um, dealing with the average man uh, and woman who can't read now is necessary. These people are volunteering their time to make that happen, and I think we should do something about that. We should help them, support them. Uh, if you guys could give us uh, another breakdown of where we should go to contact you, um, telephone numbers, addresses, and I think there was a mix-up. Uh, I don't have the time at the Carnegie. Where exactly is that located in Washington, D.C.? Uh, for that Meet the Author series kind of thing, I would appreciate it. You know, you I would, sure want to support <laughs> you guys. You would make a wonderful PR person for the African American <laughs> Writers Guild. Uh, look, uh, are you a Washingtonian by any chance? No, I'm a Harlemite. I, oh, I, okay. I come, from, I come from Harlem. I've been in Washington, D.C. since 1982, and this group and a few other groups are about the uh, about business. I won't say it's the only groups, but they're certainly about the business of taking care of our community needs. I know in, in Harlem when we had community needs, we had to support and rally behind those people who were saying the right things that we knew in our heart was correct. We're born with a certain amount of wisdom. I know what these people are talking about is correct, so I want to support them, and, I, and I'd like to urge the listening audience to certainly call in uh, after this program is over, see how we can support these folks because they're volunteers. I want to be a volunteer too. Brother, please join. <laughs> call 722 2760. 722 2760. We need your energy. And uh, closing out for us is going to be in, Ken in, in Ketchi Taifa. Yes. Yes. I'd just like to share a proverb um, from the African American Writers Guild. Without words, without writing, and without books, there would be no history. There would be no concept of humanity. Reading is to the mind what exercise is to the body. Wonderful. <laughs> and why don't you give your names again and your positions with the Writers Guild? My name is Ronald Steele. I am a freelance writer, and I am the president. Secretary and Marketing Director for the Guild. James Granger and I work on the Guild's newsletter. My name is Nikichi Taifa. I'm membership director for the Guild, and I'm, I'm the author of Shining Legacy and also a lawyer. And we'd like uh, to thank you all for coming in. It's been a really interesting discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank in you. our second hour, we'll be talking with former police chief Maurice T. Turner, and he'll be talking about his candidacy for mayor. Join us in about two, three minutes. Mm -hmm.